In the TV show The Simpsons, the god of Christianity canonically exists, and it just so happens that, throughout the series, there are several instances where Homer's devout Christian neighbor, Ned Flanders, enjoys a much better life, or even has God directly intervene to help him out. This is, of course, because Ned Flanders' purpose is to be a foil to Homer Simpson, emphasizing Homer's failings and generally drawing attention to the fact that life isn't fair, to which, of course, Homer Simpson consistently overreacts. However, I can't help but think that Ned Flanders' life is the kind of thing we should expect to see in the real world if Christianity were true. I get this not just from my reading of the Bible, but from Christians themselves, who seem to have endless stories about how God transformed their lives and how God is constantly intervening, and yet, I don't see anything remotely approaching a Ned Flanders level of separation between Christians and non-Christians in my day-to-day -day life. Despite all the marvelous stories in the Bible, despite all the wonderful anecdotes from Christians all around me, and despite how supremely powerful and willing to interfere this God-being is supposed to be, the only real differences I see between Christians and non-Christians are well within the purview of the placebo effect, memory distortion, and confirmation bias. You'd think that if there really was some kind of interventionist super-being that played favorites, that it would be extremely obvious. We would expect to see a tangible, undeniable, and otherwise unexplainable divide between the people it helps and the people it doesn't help, as we do between Ned Flanders and Homer Simpson. But this is not what we see. This is my rendition of the problem of divine hiddenness. Why does it appear as though God is so... hidden, despite what we would expect to see if such a being actually existed? I take this to be a different problem from the problem of non-belief, which relies on the idea that God wants us to believe in him. The problem of divine hiddenness, in contrast, merely points out the apparent lack of divine intervention compared to what the Bible, and modern Christians, would lead us to expect. This problem of divine hiddenness, as I've presented it, is one of the main reasons why I became an atheist in the first place. My family would go to church every Sunday, but if we didn't, nothing happened. If I thought something bad about God, nothing happened. And if I prayed to God earnestly and selflessly, nothing happened. There seemed to be no reliable causal connection between the religion I was raised in and the events in the real world. Now, occasionally, there did appear to be exceptions. I remember thinking one time that, gee, no matter how bad the weather was this week, it always seems to clear up by the time it's Sunday and it's time to go to church. But then I realized that there had definitely been rainy Sundays, and Sundays where the snow was so deep that our car got stuck, and I'd simply been counting the hits and ignoring the misses. As I continued along this path, I quickly noticed that every instance where it seemed like God did intervene was not really the kind of miraculous thing it seemed to be, and it certainly was not the kind of miraculous thing I would expect to see if a being like the Christian God was actually intervening in my life. So how do Christians explain this apparent unresponsiveness, this divine hiddenness, of God? Well, there are a few ways. Number one, they'll say that miracles do happen, and that Christianity does have a monopoly on miracles, as we'd expect, and just because you haven't personally witnessed them, that doesn't disprove their occurrence. The problem is, Almost without exception, the Christian I'm talking to didn't witness them either. They heard about them from someone else. In fact, during one of his lectures, the biblical scholar Bart Ehrman made brief mention of this, and I instantly recognized it as something I too had seen, especially in college when I was able to talk face-to-face -face with many different Christians. Most people who believe in miracles today don't believe in them because they actually saw them, but because they heard about them from someone else. This is not very convincing at all, especially if you don't already believe the religion to which these miracles are being attributed. In these cases, the simpler explanation is some combination of confirmation bias, memory distortion, and the placebo effect, 
things which I have experienced firsthand. This kind of hearsay also seriously undercuts the idea that Christianity has a monopoly on miracles. Maybe you're only aware of the claimed miracles of Christianity because that's all you're looking for. I don't even really have to speculate about that because I know that religions from all over the world have their own miracle claims, such as the Hindu milk miracle and the various miracles of Satya Sai Baba. Response number two is kind of a continuation of response number one, which is the claim that miracles do happen, and that, yeah, people from all religions do experience supernatural interventions, but those people are all being miraculously helped by demons or other non-Christian voodoo magic, whereas they, the correct group of Christians, are being miraculously helped by God. But how do they know this? I would suggest that they can't, since other religions also claim various kinds of self-authenticating revelations. So it seems that, in order to be epistemically consistent, you would either need to be some kind of universalist, wherein every religion is right, or some kind of atheist, wherein every religion is wrong. Response number three kind of gets into the problem of non-belief, but let's talk about it anyway. Christians will argue that God cannot demonstrate his power so obviously because that would rob us of the free choice to believe in his existence. However, as I mentioned before, the Bible is full of stories where God demonstrates his power publicly and even on command, which is one reason why I would expect to see this kind of thing today. In Exodus chapter 7, Moses has a God-powered miracle contest with Pharaoh's magicians, staffs turning into snakes, rivers of blood, swarms of frogs, and finally swarms of gnats. But were Pharaoh's magicians coerced into believing? No. And then, in 1 Kings 18, the prophet Elijah challenges the priests of another religion to a sacrifice contest, and on command, fire descends upon Elijah's sacrifice, but not upon the sacrifice of the other priests. Were the other priests coerced into believing? It doesn't appear so, because after all the onlookers started to praise God, Elijah had the priests killed. You know, like you would naturally do. And of course, God parts the Red Sea, God allows the ragtag Israelites to destroy the walls of Jericho, God allows his followers to survive in a deadly furnace, and God allows the apostles to perform many miracles. So I think it's very clear that the God of the Bible could, and apparently did, intervene in obvious ways, without the concern that he was robbing people of their freedom to choose to follow him. This is not at all out of character for the God of the Bible, and this is very much like the way that God interacts with Ned Flanders in The Simpsons. And so, I think my question stands. Why don't we see this kind of obvious divide between Christians and non-Christians? Why aren't Catholics the only ones who are routinely turning water into wine? Why aren't Southern Baptists regrowing amputated limbs? Why doesn't the gigantic Homer Simpson-Ned Flanders divide demonstrably exist in real life? Why does it look as if Christianity is just another religion, driven by placebos, confirmation bias, and hearsay, as I myself observed when I was still a Christian? Why does Christianity seem no more causally connected to what happens in the real world than Islam, Hinduism, Wicca, or even alternative medicine and voodoo? Every one of these groups, of course, has their own set of excuses, but surely you shouldn't need excuses in the first place. In fact, interestingly enough, this apparent lack of difference between religions and between the religious and the non-religious isn't only contemporary. It goes all the way back to ancient Judaism. Jews, too, had a robust system of excuses for their God's divine hiddenness. In Judaism, the specific agreement between God and the Israelites, the covenant, was said to be one in which God would give the Israelites special real-world protections and advantages in exchange for them following the rules that God had laid out for them. And yet, the Jews were no more successful than any of the nations around them, and in fact, they fared noticeably worse on many occasions. In my estimation, this very clearly shows that there was no such covenant, and that if a god exists, 
It was certainly not the one that the Jews claimed to have made a deal with. But the ancient Jews, of course, rationalized their God's apparent non-existence, saying that they must not have been following God's rules well enough. Yeah, that must be it. And when the essential oils don't cure your cancer, it must be because you had the wrong mindset. And when you can't find the buried treasure that Joseph told you about, then you must have done the pre-dig ritual wrong. In light of these rationalizations, I think it's pretty clear that essential oils don't cure cancer, and that there was no buried treasure to be found in the first place. It also seems clear that no ancient Jewish covenant really existed, and that these people were just making excuses for the failure of their theology. It also seems clear that no interventionist god of Christianity exists, and that its adherents are just making excuses for why their miracles don't really stand out. Fundamentally, this is a major reason why I stopped believing in God, and it's a major reason why I still don't believe in God. In fact, here's Scott Clifton, Theoretical Bullshit, explaining exactly this point. I, I think in order for me to believe in God and still be me, um, I, I think the whole, it, it wouldn't have to be, it would have to be more than just one experience like that. The, the whole structure of the world that we live in would have to be different. There, there's this video game I played when I was a kid, and in the, in the mythology of this video game, there was a god, uh, and you, you play a character in the game, but, but this god is just all around interacting with everyone all the time, like moving things, visible, you know, the, the, it's just everyone with every, anyone could talk to this God anytime that they wanted. This God was just in everyone's life in tangible ways, mo multiple different kinds of tangible ways, sometimes sounds, sometimes moving things, sometimes, you know, but if we lived in a world where God was just a regular part of our lives, like anybody else, like our parents or our pets or the, you know, then then yeah, that would be, it would be really, really, really hard. Then you would be irrational to walk around denying the existence of, of God. But we don't live yeah. in that world. We live in a world where we, we don't have these experiences and, and we're forced to interpret very normal, benign experiences in a theistic way. Given all of this information, my inference to the best explanation is that, in the same way that essential oils don't actually do anything, and there was no buried treasure to be found, and the Jews had no such covenant, the Christian God does not exist.